for joining us to help choose home when care is needed, a podcast all about the benefits and value of receiving care in a place you likely feel most comfortable, wherever you call home. I'm your host, Marilee Orsini, and I've been involved in health care at home since 1981. Each episode, I'll be talking with a guest who will help us in our quest to educate about health care at home. So let's get started. Today's episode is number 15, and our guest is Laura Page Greifinger. Laura is CEO of Quality in Real Time, a business we call Quirt in the industry, um, and she is a nurse, and she has worked in home care and hospice for over 30 years, not only as a nurse, but as a supervisor and a clinical consultant. Thank you so much for joining us today, Laura. Your experience, 30 years plus now in home care, home health care and hospice, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Tell me how you started and how you became passionate about home care. Well, um, in my uh, baccalaureate degree um, curriculum, uh, we had a public health uh, piece of it in my senior year. I was very concerned because during all of my clinical rotations, I hadn't really embraced any of them with what I thought um, I should be offering to the industry, the nursing industry. Um, But uh, part of my curriculum was um, a uh, rotation at Visiting Nurse Service of New York. Um, and two days into the rotation, I was, I was um, walking with my preceptor and saying, I think this is what I want to do, really. Um, and uh, it started there. Um, I did actually go to work upon graduation. And um, it started my, um, uh, my passion for home care and hospice um, as hospice became uh, a benefit uh, for patients in, in the 80s. Uh, and uh, it was just visiting people in their home and seeing how happy people were in their, to be in their home um, and seeing what we could do and the creativity it took uh, to um, provide systems of care uh, for patients in their home, no matter if it was for a short period of time or a prolonged period of time. And it obviously something from that experience translated into your feeling a need to emphasize quality in the industry. Am I right in that? Yes, yes, um, you are. Um, I've always been a proponent of quality, and I always looked for what I now know to be best practices in my own practice. Um, Home health is really, uh, for a clinician, autonomous practice. Uh, You are by yourself with your patient in the home, and uh, because of that, there are times Uh, you could call your supervisor, but a lot of times you are improvising uh, to make uh, a a part of the patient's plan of care work for that patient in the best possible way, all the while keeping quality at its highest level. So very early on, um, we developed quality programs uh, within community health that even stand the test of time today. Um, And uh, it's it's very important to, with people who have autonomous practice to have best practice in place and practice it at all times and to monitor their practice on an ongoing basis. Well, let's talk about this from a consumer standpoint. How, how does quality affect the consumer experience, number one? And number two, what would a consumer look for if they're choosing home health care What would they look for to know that they're choosing a home health care agency that emphasizes quality? Right. Well, um, there are a lot of, um, now there are a lot of uh, ways we can uh, look online, actually, and I do think that could be a first first choice of people, is to look online at the different types of agencies there are out there. There are a lot of them. Uh, Sometimes it's overwhelming. But um, if you look online and you go to Home Care Compare, uh, those are actual measures developed by Medicare and uh, gathered through information created from the assessment of patients. And you want to look at agencies to see their standing both within their state and within the national average 
as to the outcomes of people who go to that agency for care. Um, the higher the score um, for the uh, outcomes, the better it is, except for one part, and that is, of course, uh, the emergency room and rehospitalization. Agencies that really do care about quality will educate their staff to be the best possible that they can be, and therefore, um, the outcomes of those patients will be uh, very good. The other thing to evaluate is patient satisfaction with an agency. Um, a lot of times, this is sometimes the way people start. They ask around to their friends who might have used home care in the past and who they used and um, get the name of an agency. And I always recommend that if you are going to utilize an agency, that you interview the agency uh, before they come to your house and ask them questions about their practices and how they, um, you know, how they would uh, carry forth a referral, um, an assessment, and then, uh, you know, doing the plan of care um, and how they work together to coordinate all of that with you, the family. I do think the patient, the caregiver, and the family do need to be involved uh, in, the, in the patient's care. That is one of the really great things about home care, actually, is, is the involvement of, of all of the patient support systems uh, that go into making the patient outcomes better. Let's talk about that um, patient support system, because consumers might not know what their involvement would have to be should they choose home care for a loved one. Can you expand on that? Right. It does depend on, on the, the um, again, the agency you choose. But most um, agencies, of course, allow the patient and or family to have input into the care plan. I do recommend that someone from the family be present at the assessments that the clinician does um, and uh, feel free to uh, ask questions during that assessment um, and ask questions about why the particular the, that clinician is doing uh, those things. Uh, an example would be uh, the medications. Why would the clinician want to know all the medications that my mom is taking? Well, it's very important um, that we know the medications because they do change a fair amount. Usually patients are taking a lot of medications that could interact badly with one another and we would let you know that. And also we need to know about change in medications because it can affect the patient. Um, and it's very important to note that a lot of emergency room visits occur because of medication issues that arise. Either the patient is not taking the right medication or is taking too much or too little of medication. Um, so it's, it's very important uh, that the family member be present at the assessment understand before the assessment what home care is about and why they called home care, what they think their needs are, and see if the agency that they have chosen to come in can meet those needs. Um, you should have an idea in mind uh, as to what you need, whether it's hours of personal care, companionship, or that you need a nurse to check, an actual clinician to check up on your family member every so often um, and coordinate uh, their assessment with the doctor, the primary care physician for the patient. And if someone has ordered home health or has agreed to have home health and their loved one has come home, but they're unhappy for some reason with either the person who has been assigned to them or with the plan of care, what, what can a, a patient or their family members do? Right. That's a very good question. Um, basically, I would say the first, the first measure would be is to call the organization that you have requested uh, do the home care. Um, and sometimes, uh, in, if, especially if a person has been in the hospital and discharged, sometimes that isn't always conveyed um, who that is. It's just you get a call when you get home and, you know, I'm calling on behalf of a home care agency and uh, we plan on coming tomorrow to assess your mom. Um, but if you aren't happy, um, if you don't feel the clinician had a, an either, um, uh, I guess, a demeanor or attitude that corresponds with your uh, idea of what should be, I would feel free to call the agency, ask to speak to either a supervisor or the director 
do not stop at the desk, the in- information desk, go up the line immediately and explain exactly what it is that you found during the assessment that um, you aren't happy with or, or your mother is unhappy with. If it is the plan of care uh, that the agency proposes to you and you're unhappy and you have tried to interject um, with the clinician as to uh, what you thought the plan of care could be and the clinician uh, was not forthcoming or did not uh, you know, um, communicate with you um, the way you wanted to be communicated with, you have two choices. You either can call uh, the organization, the agency, but I would, I would preface this with a lot of times the agency is called and is given a plan of care from the doctor um, so that the doctor communicates to the agency what they think the patient may need. So the second line would be to call the patient's doctor and explain that you're not pleased with the plan of care and could the doctor explain to you why um, they have ordered this type of, of care for your mother. And a lot of times um, negotiations can occur and the doctor can call the agency back and actually amend his uh, or her's original plan of care to one that is appropriate or um meets the expectation of the family member. I'm going to switch gears here for a minute and ask you, because you've been in home care for so long, what differences do you see in home care today uh, from when you first started in home care? Uh, Good question also. Well, my first thought is the patient is much more acute um, than uh, in the early days of home care when I was in it. Um, We have very complex patients, including and up to um, organ transplant patients who come home after a protracted stay in the hospital um, and, and may not even be in their own home. They may have a home near the hospital that did the transplant because not every hospital does them. So um, there are, that's two pieces then um, that need to be addressed. Uh, but also, um, I think it does speak to, to the the home is the best place to recuperate uh, type of um, comment. Uh, it is at least your own place, and um, it's out of an institutional type of setting. Um, but um, the other thing that I see um, are people are on many more medications. Um, and the other thing that I do see is that um, education has become I think the most important part um, of home care uh, is the education of both the patient, the caregiver, and the family on um, compliance with the plan of care um, and also to engage the patient uh, to accept some responsibility um, in their disease management program, uh, so to speak. An example would be a patient who has diabetes needs to really take responsibility for their diet and for all of the things that go into their diabetic regime, such as examining their skin and making sure that uh, they don't have any injuries, and if they're on insulin, that they adhere to, um, you know, knowing what their blood sugar is at, at times and things like that, but being much more responsible for their care. In, in earlier on, I think a lot of uh, clinicians in home care did for the patient. We are now asking the patient to do for yourself and let us be part of that. Um, And then once we feel that you have achieved a certain level, we can discharge you safely and you can manage your disease process going forward. And of course, the other thing is that I see the population aging. There is a big difference in the age span um, from even, uh, you know, a few decades ago and decade before that. So every decade, we would see older and older patients. It is not uncommon to see 100-year-old patients at home now. Um, We see many more of them than we've ever seen. I haven't uh, been in home care in two decades now. So in terms of uh, visiting people in their homes, I hadn't thought about that, the fact that this aging population really is aging right in front of us. Um, Right. What geographic differences do you see? You all are in 44 states, I believe. And do you see geographic differences in either quality or provision of services or usage of home care? 
Um, that's a very good question. Yes, we actually do see uh, differences. Um, it depends to, um, I would tell you that we see more patient support in geographic areas than in other geographic areas. And by that I mean in the more suburban rural areas, we do see a lot of caregiver support and family support in those areas. Uh, and in the urban areas, we might see less of them where family might not be around uh, where the patient resides. Um, I can tell you in, um, in New York City, uh, where our corporate office is, we do see a lot of what's called NORCs, um, N-O-R-C, and that's naturally occurring retirement communities. And what that, has, what that means is that in, in the evolution of a, a person's uh, lifespan, there is usually where they are born and then they grow up and marry and have a family and a starter home, and then they, you know, age and then they move to other places. We don't see that move to other places now. People are entrenched in where they live and they stay here and they age in place and in New York City, uh, those areas were not set up for retirement communities or the aging population and have had to adapt. Um, the other thing is, is that, of course, a number of the uh, support systems of these, of these NORC um, occupants uh, have moved out of state even, and they're not close at all um, and have their own lives, so it becomes a little bit, uh, a little bit different uh, the way services are given. Sometimes you have to communicate long distance with family, and I know it's a, it's a burden on a family, too, it, to communicate long distance and to be responsible long distance also. So, yes, we do see geographic differences in terms of the support systems necessary, but we also see um, probably uh, uh, some geographic uh, differences in terms of uh, there are areas where uh, food can be a problem. There are areas where there are very few paraprofessionals or caregivers available um, to take care of, of patients so that we have to look at programs in their communities that can assist them uh, to remain in their homes uh, as, as with some support as they need it. Uh, so that's about really all I can think of at this time uh, in terms of geographic dis uh, differences. And the scenarios you are describing where there are less support systems than others, um, do you see care management or case management taking over for where some family members perhaps would have provided some type of coordination in the past? Yes, I do see that. As more and more states adopt uh, manage long-term care plans, a lot of them have opted to utilize telephonic care coordination as a primary method of contact. The other thing that has assisted in uh, these areas are, is really telehealth and um, having a telehealth machine in there and then responding only when there's an alert. Um, an example of this is that um, uh, the VA has a, a telemedicine division uh, and they serve uh, uh, veterans with congestive heart failure. And I went to a conference a couple of years ago and was amazed um, at this because they started it in the rural areas and they have 47,000 veterans on telemedicine and it has served everybody very well even in the rural areas and it allows, um, I guess, peace of mind for, uh, for the communities that can't always provide um, for, for their veterans. And I think it's an excellent program and they are expanding it. But it shows the need. Because of the rural location um, of the veterans and the usage of telehealth, are you seeing more telehealth usage now in some of these urban areas or the NORCs? Uh, yes, actually we do. Uh, there's been some very, um, I think, innovative programs uh, in New York uh, and, uh, and other places, too, in other urban areas in Boston uh, and so forth, uh, there are now um, doctors from um, the large medical centers who have assumed uh, the responsibility for doing house calls to a certain NORC um, and allows the resident to, uh, you know, uh, have some medical care. Uh, a lot of times residents would use the emergency room for their medical care. Um, and so these programs are assisting uh, screening uh, patients uh, 
who might not have known they have high blood pressure or that they are really on the edge of having diabetes, their blood sugar is a little bit high, um, and bringing in the appropriate um, care right to the NORC um, for the people has proved very beneficial. Um, and I do see telehealth being utilized more and more almost every day in many different ways and in, across all settings now. Um, I do think that um, it is a very good um, method of, of management, and my hope is, is that Medicare will recognize it as an adjunct and start to reimburse for it. Well, good. I join you in that hope. Uh, Laura, I am getting ready to end this interview, so my last question to you is, is there something I haven't asked you that you feel a consumer would need to know about choosing home as a place to either recuperate or age in place? Um, well, the only thing I can say is that for a family member to look at home care first, um, can you handle whatever the patient needs? Can it be handled at home? Can the patient remain in home with care? Uh, for certain things, um, I see now that I do think like with total joint replacements or any of those um, particular incidences, I do believe that care at home is a much better alternative than going uh, to a skilled nursing rehabilitation facility or staying in the hospital for longer times. We do find the outcomes of patients who go home are much better um, and at a quicker rate. Patients recuperate faster. They are happier at home, too. And I do believe that emotions play a part in getting well. Um, and I think that the happier the person is, the more engaged the person is. I think the more that the person does for themselves, the faster they will get better um, and have a good outcome. And if the person needs ongoing services, they will be available at home and the continuum of care will continue. Um, as long as possible, I think the patient should stay in their own house. Laura, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate this interview, and uh, you have a wonderful day. Well, you too, and it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening today, and a special thanks to our sponsors and partners, Access, National Association for Home Care and Hospice, and Core Cubed. You can find more on our website, helpchoosehome.com, and on social media. Join us, want you to spread the word, and help choose home when care is needed.